All right, well, welcome back to the free game interview series here on the Brantley Method. I'm excited today. I've got Romeo Travis with us. Uh, for those of you that don't know about Romeo um, and his background, it's, it's interesting. Uh, two years ago at Spire, we had a pretty good team and, and guys were saying, hey, you know, this might be, you know, one of the best high school teams in, in history. And, and I laughed. You know, I said, you know, this isn't even, you know, one of the best high school teams in Ohio history. You know, you think back to, you know, what they were able to accomplish, what Romeo and his team were able to accomplish, three straight state championships, a national championship. I mean, just a different level of success um, and consistent and continued success. Uh, so, you know, last year, Romeo's jersey was retired at Akron. Um, you know, and that was just a, a sign of all that he brought to not only the university, uh, but to the community. So excited to talk to you, Romeo. Excited to have a, a conversation about basketball, life, um, and, and just everything in between. So thanks for coming on. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, great introduction, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I was, I was thankful to be a part of a lot of good teams uh, during my time at St. V and at Akron U, and um, I've been acknowledged for those things. But, you know, more than anything, we won. And, you know, and that's what, what will get you the, the individual accolades is winning as long as alongside playing well. So that and, and that's going to be the, the, the main theme of, of our conversation, um, because I think that a lot of times we don't put enough focus on that. Right. And, and this day and age in this game, it seems like things have been shifted towards individual accolades and individual praise and away from, you know, winning. And, and, you know, you look at teams that have guys that win and that are winners, uh, that breeds success even post-basketball. That breeds success in life, knowing how to win, knowing, you know, what it takes to be successful, what it takes to, 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 be, to win and win at the highest level. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, growing up in Akron and, and what it is about Akron that's produced you know, winners, you know, you, you look at the, the success that, you know, St. Vincent St. Mary's on a, a, a level, you know, it's timeless to me. You know, I look at the success year after year after year. I'm, I'm looking at, you know, what you guys were a part of. And now I look at, you know, Drew, um, you know, at Cleveland State. You know, I look at, obviously, LeBron. I look at, you know, all of those guys have gone on and are continuing to win. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, what Akron, what role Akron played in that. Uh, for me, uh, I come from a different part of Akron than everybody else. So I, ca I came from, uh, I started in the projects, um, then my family moved out of the projects, moved to like just a normal bad neighborhood. <laughs> so it wasn't like the projects anymore, but it was just like a bad neighborhood. And, um, I had to find a way to escape and, and I would walk like, you know, I would walk to the park every day and just get shots up and play. And, um, it all started for me when I was by myself, just shooting on the hoop. And like my, uh, my guy, he's a grown man. I'm like 10. He's, he's like, hey, you got to come play with us. We need, we only got nine. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm only 10. Y'all grown man. He's like, I don't care. Come come play. You playing. You know what I'm saying? And, you, and I'm the smallest one on the court, but I'm the tallest one for my age. So I'm used to being close to the rim. They're like, no, nah, I bring the ball up. You dribble. You point guard. And I'm like, what? Like, you know, and so I'm scared. I'm like, but, you know, they like, they, they, you know, looked after me. They took care of me. They, they never did no trash to me or around me. And then that started to be like a thing for me, like going on playing with grown men. And then like for me, that took away a lot of fear. Like if I can play with grown men, there's nothing nobody my age could do to me, you know? And so, so like, you know, and then like they always told me, it's just basketball. Don't be scared. Like, you know, it's just basketball. You're going to win something, you're going to lose something, but it's just basketball. And so that took away a lot of fear that I had. Um, could growing up and, and and so that helped me become like a little tougher and, and helped me with my physicality and, and it just helped me like because I just play hard because at the end of the day when you're not better than somebody you're not stronger than somebody you can always play harder than somebody you know and so that's what that's how I began you know um they I was a late a late bloomer um skill wise um but I just played hard you know and that's how I got on the court and that's how I always find my way on the court on every team no matter what I always play because I play hard you know and I play for the team um and so Akron had a lot to do it for me you know because they they kind of took me under his wing and you know I'm not a hood guy I'm not from you know I'm not a street thug kind of guy 
but I always was in the streets. You know, I'm always outside playing. I'm always in the parks, but you know, I'm not a, a, but they luckily they kept me from, you know, doing all the drugs selling and being around that type of influence, but they kept me on the court. And so that was powerful for me. Well, you touched on something that I think, um, our community needs to hear more of, um, but it's something that's been going on for forever, and that's athletics as a form of escapism, right? Um, you know, util utilizing the, the camaraderie, um, the team feel, the ability to, to have the feeling of winning and being successful, um, using you know the the sport as, as an ability to take take a step out of reality for a moment or two um, of what's going on around you. You know, you constantly hear guys talk about, hey, basketball saved my life. You know, do you think that the athletics in Akron played a part in, you know, saving the lives of a lot of the young men around your age? Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, I have cousins that were killed, um, you know, who were in a different type of lifestyle. And so for me not to be in that lifestyle, these are my first cousins. Like, we grew up together. We lived in the same house. Um, for many years, my mom and their mom are sisters, and they're also best friends. So, like, you know, we grew up together. He, like, literally grew up together. And so I just happened to take that left turn, you know, and they took that right turn. And um, and not all of them, the three of them that got killed, I don't know why they got killed, you know, but I know that they lived a different lifestyle that I live, you know. And and for me, I, I can literally look look at direct steps that I didn't make direct steps that I took to get away from those type of lifestyles. And, um, and it, I don't want to say it saved me, but it definitely kept me from doing a lot of things that I shouldn't have, you know, and a lot, a lot of places that I could have been. Even, um, I remember I'm, I'm with my cousin and, uh, I see him on the, on the corner. I just pull up on him. He like, yo, cuz leave this ain't, you know, so, so, you know, stuff like that where like, you know, you could just, want to be around people you don't even have to be in that lifestyle you're just being around them at the wrong time uh can get you in some some pretty bad situations and i think basketball being gone all the time uh aau traveling i can't do certain things because i got practice i got homework etc cetera, etc cetera. uh i won't i won't go as far as to say it saved my life but it definitely protected me from a lot of places that i shouldn't have been in right. and so i'm very thankful for just sports in general or keeping me, you know, uh, and, and because you want to be around your family, you want to be around your cousins and, you know, and you just want to hang out like more yeah. than anything. Like, you know what I'm saying? You're not doing nothing wrong, but you just want to hang out with your people. And, you know, thankfully my cousins and my, even my mom and everybody was like, no, nah, you can't do that. Like my mom protected me a lot too. Um, when I was 14, I was over at my friend's house and uh, we, we broke into a house. I, I didn't break in, but I was with them. They broke into the house uh, two weeks later and like a month later, uh, we all get arrested for that, for that break in. And um, I go to jail for four days when I'm 14 years old. Uh, when I got out, my mom, my mom was like, literally, you're never seeing those people again in your life. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, and she like, it, she cut it off right there. Like, you know, that's the type of energy they have. You're not ever going to go over there, and, you know? And so like my mom protected me from like, no, oh, that's my best friend, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, he's not no more. Find some new friends, like, you know. And so she protected me from myself and from you know making bad decisions as well. Right, right. No, man, it's you. You think back on it, and you think back on um, the opportunities and, and the decisions that we had. Where if we would have made you know just one decision and, and the domino effect it could have had on the rest of our lives. Um, you know, the, being around one, like you said, one group of people or being in the wrong, you know, the wrong atmosphere and environment. Um, you know, so was that part of the decision making process when you chose to go to, you know, St. Vincent, St. Mary's or what was kind of, how did that come about? What was the, 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 <laughs> the story, what's the story behind that? It's kind of crazy because, uh, you know, I knew, I knew LeBron for a long time. Uh, we were never very close, but I always knew him. Uh, we played Pee Wee football together. Um, we went, we actually played on the same middle school team together. And so we, uh, I'd known him for a long time, but we were never like best friends or nothing. We just knew each other, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and so my um, my coach at Central Howard, which is a public school in Akron, he was like, there's this AAU team I want you to, you know, go play for. And he wouldn't tell me the name. So like, I'm like, who? He like, just go to this gym, give me an address. So I get there, it's all these guys. Like, you know, and I hated these guys growing up. 
Like I couldn't stand them. And so, because um, they always beat my AAU team. Like, you know, we had the hood AAU team. As far as, we went, as far as we went was like Columbus or West Virginia. But, you know, so we had the, like the little ghetto or whatever uh, AAU team. And so my, my freshman year, my coach was like, you got to go try out for this team. I'm like, all right, man, just give me the address. I get there, it's these guys. I'm like, man. And so um, me and Willie had situations because my cousins used to talk trash to Willie. They all went to school together behind. I didn't know they were doing this, but they used to talk trash to Willie. Like, my cousin going to bust your head when he see you. Like, you know, blah, 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 like hyping me up. I didn't even know they were doing it. So me and Will had like a little beef for a year, like a couple years, and I didn't even know why. I'm like, dang, hey, why, why do, like, you know, don't like me. Like, and then uh, and then me and we played like a, a scrimmage in, uh, against Sheon and Drew in middle school. And then, like, Drew raked my eyes out. Like, you know, he tried to steal, so I didn't like Drew. And so this whole time, like, I didn't say nothing. You know, I don't talk. I'm just like, I'm here to do my work, leave, do my work, leave. So one day, Brian just came over here talking to me, like, um, how, how your school going to look next year? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm not going back. And then Coach Drew, like, what? You know, like, yeah, I'm, I'm not going back to Central Howard. Uh, they fired our coach. And uh, I met the new coach, and I don't want to, you know, he's a good coach, but I'm cool. I don't really want to play for him. And coach Drew was like, I'm going to call your mama. <laughs> he called my mom, and uh, they, they set, worked out all the details where I can go to St. V. And that's pretty much how, how it went. So you went to St. V. You were there sophomore year, junior year, senior year. Yeah. Three straight state championships. We lost my junior year. Lost your junior year. Lost your junior year. So, so – so they one one lost one 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 lost one one one. Um, so that's a good dynamic to talk about. So first, let's talk about win, winning that first one. You know, when you you got there, you guys start playing together. Uh, what was it like? You know, what did it take to get to that that top and to win that state championship? That was the hardest. That's probably the hardest thing I ever did in my life was go to St. V. My sophomore year. Um, I'm talking about hardest thing I ever did in my life. Um, the dynamic shift uh, culturally was um, from being to a predominantly black school uh, to going to all white school. Like that's just a cultural shock. Um, from wearing whatever I want to wearing, you know, uh, dress code every day. Uh, from showing up to practice and going home to having having workouts before school workouts after study table after school then work out again you know and then having the most homework i ever had in my life so this go i go from casually doing school work casually dressing casually being a basketball player to, to to everything has been like 180 i'm talking about a complete turnaround the opposite direction uh coach drew used to come get me some days 6 a.m working out then I got school all day. I'm talking about homework in every single class. Um, then we can't even go home after school because our practice, we only had one gym at the time and the girls practiced before us. So the girls practiced from three to five. From three to five, we had study tables. So we couldn't go home. <laughs> you got two hours. You got to go to study table for, from three to five. I'm, you know, I'm 15, 16 years old. We talk about some study tables, you know, bring two lunches. Cause you're going to have to eat after school before practice. I'm like, what? And then we got three hour practice. Like, you know, I'm getting home at eight 30. I'm leaving my house some days at 6 AM and I'm getting home at eight 30 PM, you know? And this is like from being a casual basketball player to like, like, you know, being prepared for college. Like this day was really, he was really preparing that he treated it like it was college. Um, where we had weekly progress reports, um, from our teachers. And so, like, every week we had to – if we wasn't meeting standards, we got X, Y, Z to do to get back into good graces with Coach, you know. And so it was really, like – and when I say it was, like, it was, like, the hardest thing I ever did because I I was not ready for it. Like, you know, I wasn't mentally or physically prepared. I could barely make it through a practice. You know, three-hour practice, I'm like, <sighs> they're like, get your hands off your knees. We're not done yet. I'm like, <sighs> <laughs> you know, and so it was literally the, like one of the hardest times I ever, you know, physically and you know, through basketball. That was like probably the hardest thing I've been through. And so it was, I wanted to leave. I, I asked my mom every day, like, please, let, please let me transfer. She was like, no, if you start something, you're going to finish it. And thankfully, my mom would not let me quit. She wouldn't let me leave. 
She's like, you are there. You might as well enjoy it. I, I didn't like being around these guys. I didn't talk to them. Um, I just went to practice, went home. And so it was like a very difficult time for me. Um, but my mom made me stay. She definitely wouldn't let me quit. So I'm thankful for that. Well, I mean, you know, sometimes those those uncomfortable situations uh, prepare us the most for, for the future. And you talked about it, you know, preparing you for college. And, you know, I think back on, you know, that your, your senior year, um, I, I think back on that year where you guys beat Oak Hill. You know, you, you went out to the, to the West Coast, played Modern Day, beat them. Uh, Modern Day, you beat them. Um, you know, I mean, it was just one of those, those years. Uh, I think you guys went undefeated that year, right? Yeah. Yeah, we went. Um, well, one, one loss, but that was, a, um, that was a forfeit, right? That was a. <laughs> yeah, that was a, um, Ohio, you know, uh, Claire Mascaro, he trying to show his strength and his power and try to say we lost the game we didn't lose but you know um they don't want us to be in the record books they didn't want us a uh, predominantly black team running a uh, predominantly white state uh he did everything he could to negate us as a team he put us in the toughest regionals toughest sectionals toughest everything um hoping we would lose he put us against teams that we shouldn't have faced until regionals you know but he's putting us in the sectionals against these guys uh, hoping we would lose or hoping we would stumble because they didn't – for them, they like they like balance. They like parity. They want other people to have a chance to win state championships. And so he did everything to stop us. But that year was a crazy year because that loss in, in our junior year made us humble. Uh, and then a humble, talented, hungry team is the worst kind of team. You don't want to face that team yeah. because we were everything in one. We were hungry. We were humble. We were hardworking. And, but more than anything, we were together. You know, um, the best thing about the great teams is sometimes people can have off days and other people will lift them up. You know, we, all, we always knew Brown was going to at least play good. You know, like some days he plays amazing. Some days he plays great. And some days he's just going to be, you know, good because he's just naturally better than everybody. But, you know, on the days where he's just good, we need to be great. You know, on the days where he's just, you know, you know, so we had to pick each other up, and that's what we did, man. Offensively, uh, defensively, we were all locked in and tuned. Um, no selfishness, no egos. It was just a great time because everybody knew their role, man. Like, everybody knew what they had to do to get on the court, what they had to do to help the team win. And it's no like, oh. Because, like, when I look back at it now, I'm like, dang, Brian took, like, 30 shots sometimes. Like, he took, like, 25 shots, but it didn't feel like it. Like, you know, you don't even – in the game, you don't even feel it. Like, you don't even think about it like that, you know. And and honestly, I didn't care. You know, he could have took 50 shots because he's better than me. So, like, <laughs> I don't care. You know, you shoot as much as you want, you know. Uh, but a lot of people don't think like that now. Um, just to know what you're good at and where, you're, where your bread's buttered, um, you have to be, you know, on another level. And all of us bought in. You know, anybody got out of line, uh, somebody else came in and, like, you know, hey, we need you to, you know, get back in order. There was no selfishness. It was just a great time, man, just because you just – everybody knows their role and, and and plays it to perfection. It's just a great team. Like, you, it's hard to beat that, you know. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And, and, you know, coming off that success, coming off that national championship, um, you know, beating Oak Hill, beating, you know, the top teams in the country, not only winning against the top teams in your state, but the top teams in the country. Coming off of that, um, you chose Akron. You know, you chose to you know, stay at home and, and, and put, put University of Akron on the map. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, that decision and what made you say, hey, this is where I want to, you know, spend the next four years. Uh, my high school coach, Keith Dambra, he had left uh, after our sophomore year and went to Akron as an assistant. And he told me, if you don't get any offers bigger than Akron, you got to come to Akron. You know, so I'm 16, 17. I'm like, all right, whatever. And so uh, – the time goes by, and uh, I'm getting offers, but they're like, you know, Horizon League, uh, you know, s similar. You know, they're all comparable to the MAC. And um, and it comes down to the day between um, Robert Morris or Akron U. Um, and I was like, Coach Denver called me the day before I signed. He said, I'm tired of talking about this. Sign the damn. And he hung up on me. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and so I signed him. <laughs> uh, I could have waited uh, after my – I signed before my senior year. 
I could have waited and seen what schools, bigger schools may have came to the table because I played really good my senior year. And I, I probably would have got some bigger offers. But I didn't want to be somewhere that didn't want me. You yeah. know, um, I, I, I didn't want to go. I, I didn't want to go somewhere where I was accepted, not wanted. You know, and, yeah. that, and that for me, that was a big thing for me. Like, you know, I don't like, uh, especially that like, transferring into St. V. Like, I know how it feels is just to be accepted. Like, you know, like, you know, and want, and the difference between being wanted, they really wanted me there. They really want me to be there. They wanted me to be a cornerstone of that, you know, of that program. Um, so I could have waited and seen what bigger schools may have came later, but I didn't want to take that route because I didn't feel like it was the best situation for me to go somewhere and maybe never play. Like, you know, and so, like, I, I decided that I'm going to go somewhere, um, one, that wanted me, and two, where I know I can play, if not a lot, but I can play at least right That's away. Right. You know, um, I'm as good as these guys, and I can play immediately. And, and that's what happened at Akron. Um, I played all four years, you know. Um, I played a lot of minutes. I probably played, like, 15 as a freshman. Um, and each year my minutes went up, and so – that was big for me to get to be able to play through my freshman year, not watching, you know, be able to get my feet wet and get that college experience. And then, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's why I chose to stay and it's home man. you know, being home at Akron, he was not that good previously before we got there and um, being able to be home and, and kind of influence the culture of the university of your hometown, uh, I don't think that I don't think many people had that opportunity, you know, let alone the ability to do it. And so that was big for me. Right. No, no doubt. No doubt. And, you know, I know I know Coach Dan Brock, so I know uh, <laughs> I can imagine how that phone call went. You know, he he recruited. Um, short and sweet. Yeah, short and sweet. Short and sweet. He recruited a couple guys, um, a couple of my guys up to up to Duquesne, um, you know, and, and twin. You know, he, he recruited a couple of my guys. So. You know, I, I definitely uh, I can see how that conversation you know would have went, and uh, you know, but but at the end of the day, I mean, like you said, you want to go where you where you're wanted, and I tell my guys that all the time. You want to go where where you're wanted, where you're valued, where you're one of their first options or first choices. Um, so then, you know, otherwise, if you're that last minute, okay, we we have a scholarship just came open, we got to fill it. They bring you in, they might recruit around you, and. So you had you had an opportunity to to have a great career at Akron. Um, you know the career leader in blocks. Um, you scored quite a few points. Um, you, I mean, you did a little bit of everything for them, and it opened up the doors for you to play professionally. And, and that's one of the things that you know, growing up, you know, you talk about being that ten year old boy out there on the court playing with grown men. Did it ever enter your mind at that point in time? that that little ball that you are using as, as a form of you know escapism right like you're you're just you're just escaping the reality of life playing a game that you love and having fun with it on a court uh, did it ever click in your head that hey this little ball right here might take me around the world never um never in my life uh, first I, I i played football anyway first um and i was a football guy uh i love football I love watching. I love. I enjoy watching football more than I enjoy watching basketball. Um, so I really love football. Like that's my favorite sport. Um, but I couldn't play it forever. Like I didn't love it enough. I actually got recruited bigger for football um, to bigger schools. Uh, I just didn't have it in me. When they told me the schedule, I, I said, this, 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 no, this, is no, "This is literally no way I can do that. I, I can't work out for." for nine months, uh, play for three. Like, you know, I, I just can't. Like, you know, it makes no sense to me. And so I didn't. Um, but I never thought uh, any sport would take me anywhere, man. I, honestly, I was just going with the flow. I didn't have a plan. I, I Thankfully, God had a plan for me because I didn't. Uh, I was just living, you know. Uh, I did the best I could every chance I got. And, um, and God just guided my steps to a place where I ended up playing professional. I didn't even... Until I was 20 years old, I didn't even know there was professional leagues outside of the states. Until I was 20 years old, until my, until my teammate um, Derek Tarver was like, "Man, I'm gonna buy you some clippers because when you go overseas, you don't have to know how to cut your own hair." I'm like, "What?" He's like, "Yeah, you you probably gonna go overseas and you know you gonna play professional." I'm like, "Man, what are you, 
So, you know, I'm like, man, I'm like a freshman, end of my freshman year, so I'm 19. I'm like, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, <laughs> he, gave me some, he gave me some clippers and, like, started practicing. <laughs> I'm like, all right. And so, you know, lo and behold, he's seen something that I didn't see. He knew some things that I didn't know about. And then he would come back every year, tell us about professional and tell us how it was. And he was like that gateway. This before social media. This before the games were live streamed. So you didn't have a, 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 a direct connection. All you had was uh, like somebody who was telling you how it was going. But then uh, my senior year came and, and then agents started approaching me. Uh, telling me I definitely had a chance to go on overseas and I might have a chance to play in the NBA. And I'm like, you know, I'm just like baffled by the whole thing. I'm like, I know I can play good. I'm, I'm a good player, but I don't think like, you know, I'm that good. And lo and behold, um, I signed with an agent after, after my uh, senior year and I got a deal to go overseas. So it was just like mind blowing because I didn't, I didn't know any better. Like, you know, I was kind of ignorant to the fact but once I started learning more about it and then people can actually make a nice living over there and a career out of it, I was definitely um, more in tuned because uh, I didn't, I worked out a lot, but I didn't really work at my game, you know, um, until my sophomore year in college, you know, I, I worked out, I was always in the gym, you know, doing mic and drills and, you know, dunking, picking the ball off the floor and dunking and things like that. But I, I never expanded my game. I wasn't working on my ball handling. I wasn't working on my jump shots. I wasn't working on my face-up moves. And then, like, once I started to work on that, my level of progression just shot up, you know, and I just got better and better and better. Well, well I mean, you know, sometimes it's, it takes somebody looking at us from an outside angle to, to see things in us that sometimes we don't see in ourselves. And, um, you know, that's a blessing that the game was able to, to take you to that point. And I think that... You know, that gives you a perspective that a lot of people don't have. And, you know, with everything going on in the country today and, you know, everything that's happening, um, you know, from a standpoint of the, the systemic racism and the, the prejudices that, are, that have been faced by, by our people in this country for, forever, you know, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about and talk to you about a little bit is, you know, the treatment internationally. As a black man, you know, you lived in 10 different countries. You know, what was that experience like? You know, how were you received? Uh, it's funny. Um, it's pretty funny. Not funny. Ironic, I should say. Um, in certain countries, like France, for instance, uh, they look at you and they look, they see a refugee or a son. Like, I'm light-skinned, so they see a son of a refugee and a mixed white French woman. So they look at you like, and then they hear you speak English. They're like, oh, you're not, okay you're not here taking away from our, our government. And then they, hear, they, they see, I'm a big man. Oh, you play basketball. Hey, how you doing? Oh my God, you play basketball. But before that, it's like, you know, they treat, they look at you like, um, like you're a refugee, you just living off the government. And so they give you that like, who is this guy kind of look? You know, um, that's France. Germany, the Germans are actually more open because they have a lot of, Army bases, Navy base, Air Force base in Germany. So a lot of these pockets of Germany are are used to black people, American black people, and so it's it's actually more accepted there because they used to seeing American black people in pockets of Germany. Uh, and one of the pockets is where I lived uh, near Stuttgart, Germany. There's an army base, so it was like they're used to seeing black people, so it wasn't like a big deal. Croatia, I was literally one of two black people. It was me and my teammate. And so they have no black people. And it's, uh, and this, my teammate, uh, they said, it's like, I seen a black woman getting on the bus. Is your mom in town? <laughs> what? Like, what are you talking about? So I seen a black woman here. Uh, she, she's not your mom? Man, no. Like, what are you talking? So like, they don't even see, like, they don't see black people. Like, they don't exist. Uh, and if they see you, they know you're there for a sport, so they just show you mad love. Um, Israel, they treat you fair with respect because they know uh, you, you're there to play basketball. Um, but more times than not, once they realize that you're an athlete, they show you love and respect. But if they just see you just to see you, they still see you as a black person. You know, um, In Germany, they cross the street and get away from you. Uh, they clutch their purse. Um, they don't speak to you. You say hello in their language. You know, they don't speak. You say, how are you in their language? They walk right past you. Um, 
Ukraine was similar. The Philippines, they love you. They love you so much in the Philippines. It's almost too much. Uh, I don't go to the store uh, unless my wife absolutely, like, she's like, come to the store with me. I'm like, you know, I hate going out there because it's just people just, they love you so much. They want to, you know, come up on you. They want to take pictures and et cetera, et cetera. And so it's just like, man, I don't want to do this, but it's just all love out there, literally all love. But it's just, man, honestly, you're you're perceived as how people perceive you in the States via movies, via music. And so they perceive you as these things, um, you know, as misogynists. They, when they find out I'm a husband, you got a wife? Yeah. Uh, you got kids? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're not chasing girls? No. Like, you know, uh, like I'm not this, but like, man, um, I played for the Macedonian national team. My teammates like, you're never like any black guy I ever met before. And it's weird. He's like, yeah, all these other guys that come out here, they're chasing girls. They're partying every night. You know, you go, you come to practice, you go home. You come to practice, you go home. If the team go out, I'll go out, meet everybody, you know, for a drink or whatever. But I'm not just like, the guy who wants to like you know he's like well you're not out here buying bottles and you know I'm like no like you know that's not me that's not what I need to do like that's not that's not that's not helping my family like you know I'll you know I'll go out and have a good time and you know hang out with the guys but that's not I don't need to be that guy anymore I mean I used to have fun and hang out but now you know I'm a father I'm a husband like these things are important to me these things matter to me and and I want to actually show you that there's more than not black men that do that you know, there's more black men that actually are fathers. There's more black men that actually are husbands than than not. Just because uh, you, the small percentage you met, you may have met 50 black people in your life. You right. know, and so and so, don't let the, that 50 lead you to think that we're not actually great people and, and we don't take care of our responsibilities. How did your family experience? What was their experience like? You know, um, your wife and your kids. What did they think about the overseas lifestyle? Uh, my wife, she didn't particularly care for France, uh, just because of similar things. You know, she's like, you know, like me, kind of fair skinned. It so they kind of look at us like, you know, we're Africans or we're mixed with African, and and so they kind of perceive us as like, you know, because you know, not for no disrespect to the French Africans, but a lot of them, uh, you know, are refugees and they come, they live off the government. And so these people think that they just come in to live off the government and, you know, and et cetera, et cetera, which is far from the truth. Another thing that's far from the truth, there's a lot of great French African people, um, you know, affluent, you know, who, who actually help the economy. But that's another, that's another conversation. <laughs> um, but yeah, they treated my family similar, man. Um, you know, but my daughters are such, like my seven-year-old, she's such an open, loving person. She don't let people treat her any kind of way. You know, so she's going to love you. She's going to hug on you. She's going to treat you, you know, she's going to hurt. She's going to like be the one that says like love overcomes everything because she don't care about none of that. Yeah. She's just going to hang out with you, party. Like, I don't care. She, oh, she don't like me. Oh, I'll find somebody else. It's okay. You know, like, you know, she's that kind of person. So and it's just weird, but uh, it's, it's definitely strange because my wife don't like, she didn't like doing things by herself. She didn't like going places by herself without me. Uh, just because how she was perceived and how, you know, people kind of, it was just difficult for her. Man, that's tough. That's tough. And you talked about, you know, earlier when we chatted, you were saying that, you know, one, one more year. So uh, Corona corona hit and, um, you know, obviously, you know, changed the, the dynamic uh, of sports, you know, not only on a national level, but globally. Um, you know, last year, we retired to Jersey at Akron. Um, it was a huge celebration. Um, when when that retirement happened, was it already in the back of your mind that you were you know leaning towards the end of, of your playing days, or, or where where was your thoughts with that? Oh, it's crazy because um, the Jersey retirement kept me from going overseas because I had a deal on the table and um, the team wouldn't let me come back for my Jersey retirement, and so I stayed. Uh, well, almost, like, I'm talking about the only thing is they wouldn't let me come home from my Jersey retirement. That's the only thing that kept me from signing the contract. And then I would have been overseas when Corona hit and I would have been away from my family and it would have been a crazy situation. And so I didn't play. And um, I had 
uh, I wanted to play another year or so, but when Corona hit, it kind of changed everything, you know, it kind of changed because I was thinking about retiring, just not playing anymore. But I don't want to, uh, I've been thinking like, I don't want to end my career, you know, because of COVID-19. I don't want to be that person that never played again due to a global pandemic. I want to kind of end, end my career the way I want to. And, um, and so that's what's going to keep that, why I'm going to play one more year. And, and so that's what the situation is. So I'm going to at least play one more year. Nice. Maybe just one, hopefully. <laughs> so, so when it's done, when it's all done, do you join – you know, former teammates Drew Joyce or, or Nick Dials and, you know, stepping into the coaching side of things. Is that is that a path that you've thought about? Uh, I mean, uh, I want to give back um, in some way, shape, or form to the youth basketball-wise. You know, I want to give back. Uh, and, and coaching is a great way to give back um, the knowledge that I've gained over these years, but it's not the only way. Um, and my biggest thing is I don't want to be tied to coaching and if I can't do other things. You know, I like to have my hands in a lot of pots and do a lot of different things. Um, and so I want to be able to coach. Uh, coach Drew already told me if I ever want to join the staff at St. V, I can do that at any time. Um, so that's that's always going to be there on the table. And um, I just – I don't know what how I want to give back, you know. And, and coaching, to me, limits you to your team, to your group, to your specific pocket of people. And I want to be able to reach – more than more than that so this last couple of years i did a little bit of consulting so i would go to teams watch their practice for a few days um see where they can improve see where i think they can add and i would just implement those things in for a day or two and then just move on to a new team yeah and so those are certain things that i've tried to do so i stay within basketball but i'm not tied in and have to you know do something every day but i definitely want to do something uh with kids and sports um, just so I can give back, man. I feel like it's so necessary for people who quote unquote made it to, to give back and, and to always, always, you know, pay it forward, you know, um, and just keep getting guys and, and hopefully, you know, inspiring guys to be better than they were. Like that's my only goal in life is to inspire people to be the best person that they can be, you know, um, Everybody has different paths. Everybody has different, you know, places they're going to go. Some people are never going to play after high school, and that's fine. You know, that's not your path, but the things you learn, um, the people skills, your, your team working skills, and all these other things that are going to make you a good person can help you in life. And that's what I want to do is be able to help people grow and be the best person that they can be. So I don't know if coaching is the best avenue for me to do that, but I do want to help somehow, some way. Well, it's, it's often said that the true sign of a person's character is who they are when nobody's watching. And, you know, it's funny. I don't, I don't know if you know this, but I got a picture last year. Uh, it was during the during Christian's tournament. Um, and uh, you, you pulled Andre Polk, you know, my, my, one, of, one, of, one of the players that I'm the closest to. Um, you pulled him to the side after his game and you were having a conversation with him. And, you know, Christian sent me the picture and he said, look, you know, Rome's here. He's, he's given he's given Andre some pointers and some, you know, just just real conversation. And, you know, something to be said about, you know, here it is the first time you're meeting this young man, seeing this young man. But you saw him play and you felt moved to the point of, hey, I have to say something like I have to you know, give him some encouragement, give him some some words of direction. So, you know, hearing that you, you're talking about how can you influence and how can you help that next generation and how can you help those kids? You know, I, I've seen it without even being there. Right. Seeing it from afar. Is that something I mean, you see it, you see it with LeBron, you know, with, with all the things that he's doing both on the on the court, off the court and film movies, you know, et cetera. Um, you know, is that something that was, was kind of embedded in you guys at St. Vincent, St. Mary's or something that, you know, maybe they, you know, Coach Drew gave you a little bit more of an um, a, a, a internal kind of, hey, I have to give back and, you know, kind of lit a spark within you. Is that where that kind of came from? I mean, if you look at Coach Drew and the commitments that he made for the team and the time commitments he made, uh, now that I'm a father, uh, I have kids and to the time commitments that he made to us and not just the coach though, you know, like um, picking people up, uh, making sure people have food, 
um, AAU trips, all the, like, these are real life time commitments. As a father, now I'm thinking back, like, man, how did he have time to do all this and be a dad and go to work and do all this other stuff? And so um, he was definitely, he indirectly influenced us a lot, like, you know, um, and so he does a, he still does a lot for people. And so for me, it's, uh, it's my duty and my goals to help people because people help me. Because I was the kid that, you know, I used to still change out of the wish fountain to get, to catch the bus home, you know, and um, a, a preacher came up to me, Mr. Pastor Noah, I'll never forget it. He told me, put that change back. He just seen me taking money out the coin, uh, you know, the, the big coin fountain people throw their wishes in. I'm, I'm still in quarters trying to, so I can catch the bus home. And he's like, put that back. Here's $2, you know, to catch the bus home. Now you got bus fare. And so like stuff like that, people, always looked out for me you know people always took care of me people and it's directly or indirectly like, people always like you know made sure that I was okay and for me to, to turn my back on people like that like that's I, I don't it don't sit right with me you know I cannot not give back I cannot not see something in somebody and I could like yo you're not reaching your potential right like you know uh you're not you're not being the best person you can be even just last night, uh, my guy, my guy Marcus Johnson, who played at St. V, texted me, when are we working out? Where are we working out at this week? Where are we at? You know, and like, you know, I just took him under my wing. I'm betting him. I'm betting him like, yo, I bet you won't lose 20 pounds in a season. You know, uh, things like that. Like, you know, I don't know Marcus like that. He didn't, he's, you know, I got nephews his age, and but he's, I just felt obligated to challenge him and push him. And that's just something that I feel like if I don't do that, um, I would be doing the people that did that to me. Coach Chris Harrison, man, like he, he used to push me so hard. He was like, "Boy, you don't know where you could be at." He's like, "You know, I didn't did it. You could do it too." You know, and and so a lot of people just showed me love throughout my lifetime. And so I would be doing them a total injustice if I didn't just. And that's the minimum, you know. What I'm doing now is just speaking to kids and and seeing something that they can add to their game. That's the bare minimum. Like, there's so much more that I want to do in the future, but. I, I feel obligated, like, you know, because the world took care of me, like, you know, uh, literally. And it, when people say it takes a village, it really does, you know, it really takes uh, a village of people to, because if you just have one perspective or one point of view, that's how we have narrow-minded and closed-minded people. And a lot of these people who have these narrow minds because they don't have a village, they don't have a, a different perspective of other people. And without that village, you know, I would be narrow-minded closed mind. I was narrow minded uh, even after going to St. V. Um, but playing overseas opened my mind immensely to the world and see different things and, and be a different person. I, I've grown so much and I'm thankful for everybody that poured into my life. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, and you know, I mean, your experiences shape you and, you know, they, they change you, they shape you. And the fact that you're you're all about sharing those experiences and utilizing them to to help others is huge. Um, and, and uh, you know, I want us to end on, on this. Um, it's often said, be the person that you needed when you were younger. And, you know, my purpose for, for creating this platform is to give, you know, those young student athletes that, you know, maybe don't believe that they can do it or don't have the, um, that, that person kind of in their ear, you know, giving them that encouragement. Or like you said, they have only have one perspective and, and they don't see the village. They don't see, you know, what, what it could be like if they locked in and focused a little bit or what, you know, success could be there if they took things a little bit more seriously. So, um, you know, I want you to think about when you were younger, you know, uh, that, that one thing that you needed to hear, or that one person that you needed in your life, if, if somebody's watching this right now, you know, what's that one piece of advice that you've gained um, through, you know, playing on a global scale uh, that, that you feel would have changed your perspective at a younger age? I mean, uh, if I had known, if I had known, that all it took was real life hard work. And it's, it's kind of cliche to say this, but if you, if you really work at not just any kind of work, like there's a difference between specific skill set work. If you work on things that you can apply to your life and not just sports. So if you want to be 
if you want to build websites, if you learn how to make these specific websites for your skill set, you you could possibly be the best in the world. Um, just for for instance, for me, I didn't shoot a lot. I never shot a lot of threes. I didn't something about the three point line that really just messed up my head. I don't know what it was, but I was a great mid range shooter. And so every day I'm shooting mid ranges. I'm shooting and now. I shoot probably 60% from the mid range in games. You know what I'm saying? So my whole thing is to find your skill set, find find something you're good at and then make it something you're great at. So if you're a great rebounder, if you're a good rebounder, be a great rebounder. If you're a good defender, be a great defender. And um and ask for advice, you know, and don't be afraid to to have that that hard conversation with your coach. Um a lot of kids always, you know, uh, he ain't doing this for me. He ain't doing that for me. Well, why don't you talk to him and see, like, you know, what where you can be better at? Because, you know, your coach, he wants you to be better for him. Like, the better you play, the better it's going to be. So I, I, would ask, I, would, I would say to take a hard look at themselves and find out what, what's best for them and then, and then ask somebody to give them a plan to be the best person that they can be uh, on and off the court. So find out if you're a shooter, okay, find out how I can become JJ Reddick or, you know, uh, you know, so like, you know, because for me, uh, I didn't take the, the necessary steps until later in life to become the best player that I can be. You know, um, I did just enough. If I had one workout, I was doing one workout. If I had, if I had one weightlifting session, I was doing a half a weightlifting session, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> I was doing, I was doing just like, you can't do just enough and expect to be, really good at anything yeah you know uh you can't do just enough uh you can't study just enough and expect to get good grades you can't do just enough in a workout and expect to get a division one scholarship or you know play pro so you got to do more than just well do more than just enough you know uh sure. don't you know, beat all requirements uh that's that's my beat all requirements if somebody requires you to, to make 10 make 12 you know, yeah. if somebody if somebody says shoot for thirty minutes, shoot for thirty five. You know, um, so that that was something that I would was suggest is just beat all beat all requirements because you know, there's it, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of extra. I like I like that, and that's the first time I've heard that. Uh, don't worry, I'm not gonna put it on a t-shirt, but <laughs> I love it. Beat all requirements, and I think that you know, like you said, that transcends basketball. You know, that's life, right? And you know, a lot of times, especially as black men, we're coming to the table, you know, with, you know, what meets the requirements. And, you know, we're upset when that's not enough, right? Yeah, um, it's, not, it's not enough. Yeah. And, <laughs> and that's why, you know, like I said, I mean, we've got to, we've got to be, oh, I, I love it. I absolutely love it. I appreciate you taking time to chat with me today, no, man. No, no problem. Thanks for having me. I uh, appreciate it, man. Any, we, uh, we got each other's information. We want to stay connected. For, for sure. And anything I can do to help you on your journey, um, you know, as you transition to doing more consulting and, and coaching, you know, that's what I do. That's what I love to do. And like you said, I mean, for me, I was, you know, being at Spire, you know, it was uh, a lot of people don't realize the commitment that it takes um, to when, when you're part of a program or part of a, a team. And I wasn't able to do a lot of the things that I do now, the things that I love to do. So I definitely know what you mean from that perspective. Uh, Yo, but anything I can do to help, man, just let me know. I'm, I'm, I'm here for you. I uh, appreciate that. All right, brother. My dog's over here, My dog's over here acting up. <laughs> you want to say hi, boy? Boy, say hi. <laughs> what, what's your dog's name? Boy, boy. Boy, boy. What's going on, boy, boy? <laughs> our kids, obviously, our kids name too. <laughs> <laughs> did, did he get to go to the, uh, to the dog birthday party yesterday? No, we left him at home. We didn't want him to be getting pumped on. He's a little dog, so we didn't want to. <laughs> We want him to be taken advantage of. <laughs> Keep his virginity intact. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> All right, man, I, I appreciate everything, man. Uh, We're going to stay connected. Uh, thanks for, for sure. having me on. Um, God bless, man. You know, stay safe and during this, these trying times. For sure, for sure, man. Take it easy. I appreciate you. All right, thanks. Have a good one. Yeah.